chapter 5, and we're, we're encamped in, uh, in the desert. We're encamped around the tabernacle, and God is teaching us. Now, as we get into these next chapters of Numbers, we begin to see that there's some concepts being introduced into this about human beings. Now, fundamentally, we need to understand that God will always use things of the natural to give us insight into the supernatural. We're a people that understand flesh and blood. We don't understand ethereal. We don't, look, you know, even tells us you can't see the wind. But you know it blows. Well, how do you know it blows? You can't see it. Well, there's a certain measure of faith involved in things. But when God gives us lessons, He tends to use things like the body. Well, it gets very intimate, doesn't it? It's very personal. There's things that we think are defiling. We things there are things that we don't talk about. Those kind of oh, we don't oh, we don't talk about that. But God does talk about that. He talks about that because he draws these comparisons between the physical to give us an introduction. How can you tell somebody about holiness and cleanliness and 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 all these concepts if you don't give them something relative that they can grab a hold of, a tangible object lesson, something that they're quite familiar with? Well, you can't, and especially a people that that just came out of 430 years in a foreign land. They knew nothing about holiness. They knew nothing. What was their example? Their example was people worshiping Dagon and worshiping uh, uh, the Nile River and the fertility gods and and idols and and, uh, objects and suns and moons and representations and even people for that matter. For Pharaoh himself was worshipped. So when you're trying to teach a new lesson, and in this new lesson you're trying to say, I want you to do things different. I want you to be a people set apart. I've brought you out here so I can get your attention. I can spend time with you and I can work with you. What do you have? You have animals. You can refer to the animals. And that would be easy to look at the animals and say, well, that's about the animals. So in order to make this relevant, he has to make it personal. And as we get introduced to these concepts in numbers of personal affairs, bodily function, bodily discharge, cleanliness, uncleanliness, behavior, thought life, patterns of behavior, it has to become personal because unless it applies to me, in the natural mind, we're going to justify that, oh, he's not talking about me, he's talking about sheep. Oh, he's not talking about me, he's talking about those people. Oh, he's not talking about us. He's talking about Egypt. I'm not in Egypt anymore. That doesn't apply to me. And so as we look at these scriptures, we need to understand that he's using things of the natural to minister to us, to show us a higher picture. When we read the Torah portion, usually two or three weeks out of the year, I'll get a phone call from Wayne. In Atlanta, I got the same phone call from our service leaders there saying, Oh, I'm in that part of Leviticus that's talking about bodily discharge. How am I supposed to get up there on a Friday night in my lovely suit and my nice tallit and talk about bodily discharge? Well, you just do it. It's in the Word of God. It's not pick and choose. There's things that God wants to show us because He wants us to have a profound lesson. He wants us to understand that the same disgust that we have for feces, He wants us to have for sin. The same stink and the same reaction we have to something which is a foul odor, he wants us to have to sin. And if we can make that connection, make that connection, make that real connection, that he's showing us these things in the natural because he wants us to have that same reaction and that same distance I want nothing to do with that. I want nothing to do with that. I don't want to go there. I don't want to be involved in that. I don't even want to talk about it. If we have that same reaction to sin in our life, we're going to live a life which is moving towards holiness. You know, in our discipleship group in the morning, we talked about um, practicing sin or uh, committing sin. Well, the practice of sin is something that's repetitive. The committing of sin, all of us, 
you know, are, are you a liar if you tell a lie? Well, you've committed a sin. If you repent of that sin and you don't do it anymore, then you're working towards, you're moving towards, moving towards, you're striving for something better. But if you're a pathological liar, a chronic liar, and all you do is lie, 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 okay, that's practicing sin. You're making no effort whatsoever to move away from it. Well, we know people like that in our lives. We know adulterers. We know alcoholics. We know pornographers. We know, you know, if you live in life, you come across all kinds of people, people that lie, steal, cheat, murder, do all kinds of things. And you try to distance yourself from it. But if you can't identify the fact that they are a loved creature and creation of God, that just like the prophet, when we take a stand against a prophecy, we're not accusing the prophet, we're testing the word, not the prophet. Well, the same way when God talks about sin, he's not condemning the person, he's condemning the sin. Now, which sin is worse? Adultery, murder, homosexuality, larceny, embezzlement, petty theft? Which sin's worse? It's the same. Sin is sin. No higher level, lower level. Therefore, if I'm consorting, if I'm counseling with somebody on drug addiction, and they're a member, God bless you, and they're a member of the congregation, should we not have somebody who is equally involved in homosexuality as a member of the congregation and ministering to them about their sin and trying to work with them to get counsel them through that challenge in their life? Should we reject the person because of the sin? This would be an empty, empty, empty building without a rabbi. if every one of us was condemned when we've committed a sin. Now, if I were practicing sin, repeating behavior over and over and over again, it was considered and defined as sin in the, in the Word of God, then that would be a problem, wouldn't it? And we've seen those problems occur. We see pastors and we see leaders fall because of the temptations. And if you're not praying for us, then you're, you're as much opposed to us as you are anything else. Because Yeshua said clearly, if you're not for us, then you are against us. And so the way you support us is not only financially and not only in your attendance, but in your prayer. But as we get into, into these next chapters of Numbers, we begin to see God introducing concepts to us. So in chapter 5, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Instruct the Israelites to remove from camp anyone with an eruption or a discharge and anyone defiled by a corpse. Separate yourself from all those things that are unclean. He began to define for us. Remove male and female alike, put them outside the camp so that they do not defile the camp of those who, in whose midst I dwell. So where God is present, sin and filthiness cannot be. God's trying to introduce us to this concept of understanding clean and unclean. Now, of course, Scripture tells us that what God proclaims is clean is clean. Therefore, what God proclaims as unclean is also unclean. So in the vision that he gave to, to uh, Peter, and he was showing him animals, and he was using that as an example, and he was specifically referring to Gentiles because of the introduction of Cornelius and welcoming him in and beginning the ministry to bring in the gospel and the good news of the promised Jewish Messiah to the non-Jewish community. And for God to open that up to, to make it clear that this was for all mankind, not just for the Jewish people. To the Jew first in an order, okay, but not exclusive. It was Yeshua himself that said, it's not what goes into the mouth that makes a person unclean, but what comes out of the mouth. Okay, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we have an impure and unclean heart, we're going to see that manifest in the world. Everybody is nice until you scratch them. Everybody's nice until you disagree with them. Right? And everybody nice? Everybody's pretty much nice. Oh, we get along. Hi, how are you? Oh, nice to see you. Oh, good to see you. But then you get into it with them, and then all of a sudden there's friction, right? Friction. 
So God's saying, when this occurs, put them out, separate them. Don't we see that in Matthew Matthew 18? If your brother commits, a, if your brother offends you, go to your brother in private, and then if he does, if he, if he's not willing to receive it, then go to him with a witness. Then, if that still is a problem and it's still ongoing, then go to him and bring him to the rabbi, to the pastor. And if he's still in that situation, bring him before the congregation. If he won't turn away from it, put him out. Well, where do we get that? Is that just man trying to be difficult and trying to lord over another man? Or is this biblical? If someone is defiled in sin and will not repent and will not turn away from that sin and con- continues to commit that sin, and they want to do it here, should we tolerate that? God won't tolerate that. Why should we allow sin to be committed and defile the house of the Lord? We shouldn't. Oh, well, what about the alcoholic that comes here? Don't drink the wine. Don't put it in front of them. Don't let it be a stumbling block. Or what if he comes drunk? Put him out. Minister to him and take him out. Minister to him. In love. It's in love. It's in love. This isn't saying throw them out. This is saying separate them. If you're separated from the rest of the people, then what you're going through can be specifically addressed. Quite brilliant, I might say. Group therapy is really wonderful as long as it's augmented by what? One-on-one sessions. Well, here's God's establishing group therapy, group ministry. We have sermons and we have teachings we have all these things but if one of you is defiled let's put them out and then we will inspect them and work with them to see if we can't get the defilement out of their life well god's establishing that it's important now in the wild kingdom if the weak one is put out by the herd what happens gets devoured and dies okay now why would they do such a thing well because Didn't we read here about how they said it's better for one to die than for all? Wow, you mean we're introduced to this for one to be put out for the the salvation of all? For one to. Wow, it's a whole core introduction to concepts, but yet we see this as nasty, oh, yucky. It's all about bodily discharge, but it's not about bodily discharge. It's about clean and unclean. It's about being defiled. It's about what we're supposed to do when we're confronted with sin, what we're supposed to do when people are sitting in front of us or exhibiting behavior or exhibiting disease. If you come in here hacking and coughing and you've got a terrible fever and you're, you're ashen and what's going on while well, I was diagnosed with contagious, whoa, put them out. <laughs> I love you from afar. But isn't this what God is saying? I can minister to you better one-on-one by getting you the proper care, putting you in isolation, keeping you from infecting everybody. Feeling your pain and feeling your pain are two completely different things. Okay? You know, I feel your pain. No, I feel, oh, I feel your pain. You know, don't take me down with you. Okay? Love us enough to separate yourself, and God's telling us that. If you have an issue, come get counseling for it. And maybe part of that counseling is you need to stay away from the congregation for a little while until you get this resolved because you're being tempted. You're being put in a position like that. Well, God's showing us this right here, how to behave, how to conduct ourselves. And when we see things flagrantly exhibited and we recognize, how do I know that you have a discharge? Your clothes are soiled. There's something going on. There's an odor. There's a something. Something. Let's deal with it. The Israelites did so, putting them outside the camp as the Lord had spoken to Moses, so the Israelites did. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites. When a man or woman commits any wrong toward a fellow man, thus breaking faith with the Lord, and that person realizes his guilt, he should confess the wrong that he has done. 
He shall make restitution in the principal amount and add one-fifth to it, giving it to him who is wronged. Isn't our court system now based on damages? We have a whole system that says, all right, you're found guilty, now let's assess the damages. Make restitution. I ran into your building, I knocked out the corner wall. Okay, great, you were speeding, here's your ticket for speeding. I, yes, I was speeding. Now you have to make restitution to fix the wall. And it should be punitive. We shouldn't have incentive to commit sin. We shouldn't have incentive to break laws. We should have punitive. We should make a deterrent. If you talk to Miss Laura, she's a strong believer in deterrence. Let's put cameras all outside the building. Putting a big alarm system and, and power locks on doors is not a deterrent. Cameras are a deterrent. Right? Those are deterrents. You know, having uh, steel buildings and things like steel vaults and, and big walk-in vaults like the banks have, well, once you're inside, well, you can set it on fire, you can do all these other things. What you want to do is a deterrent. Drive by the place, say, video surveillance. Okay, go pick on somebody else. Let it be a deterrent. And so God's putting up deterrence. Let's make deterrence to sin. Let's make deterrence to committing crimes and offenses. Let's put a system in place that says restitution above and beyond. You know, he does that with the tithe. He talks about the fact that redeeming the tithe. Well, the tithe can be redeemed. Yes, there are legitimate reasons to redeem the tithe. But when it comes time to making restitution for bringing the tithe back into the storehouse, he says, add 20% to it for the privilege and for the redemption of the tithe. So God has a consistent system. He doesn't have a false balance. He doesn't have different scales for different... One scale, one system. And if you look consistently through the Word of God, 20% is a fair increase that he's established above and beyond what an amount is. He shall make restitution in the principal amount and add one-fifth to it, giving it to him who he is wronged. If the man has no kinsman to restitution can be made, the amount repaid shall go to the Lord for the priest, in addition to the ram of expiation with which expiation is made on his behalf. So there has to be a sacrifice as well. Remember the whole system of guilt offering, sin offering. Guilt offering, my offense against you. Sin offering, my offense against the Lord. All this is being now put into place. Now we're in the practical. See, we're in the theoretical. We're in the if this, then this, if this, then this. Now we're in the practical. Okay, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And this is what you need to do. But where does it start? Speak to the Israelite, when a man or woman commits any wrong toward a fellow man, thus breaking faith with the Lord, and that person realizes his guilt, he shall confess the wrong he has done. What's the new covenant tell us? Confess your sins one to another, and he will be faithful to forgive your sins. Where is that established? It's established right here in the Torah. There's a provision to make restitution and be forgiven. If you realize your guilt, you're going to be forgiven. How can you confess something you're not aware of? Well, how many things we do accidentally? Well, that was the whole Day of Atonement situation. That was Leviticus 23 where God established the Day of Atonement. Where all of Israel would be saved. All of Israel would be forgiven for their unintentional sins. It was for the national forgiveness of Israel. But as you go through life, sure, I can walk by you and not even know that I, you saw me and I didn't see you, and that offended you because I didn't stop to talk to you. That's an unintentional sin. I didn't even see you there. I was focused on something else. And if you know me, if I'm, I'm tunnel vision. If I'm looking at that point, you're right. I didn't see you. You're exactly right. And if you happen to be right there, I might go through you. But you knew what I was because I've told you for four years now. That's and if the Lord changes me, it'll change. Part of our drive and part of our vision is that drive. You know, you gotta love me for it, you gotta hate me for it. It's okay. I can live with it. If the man has no kinsman, he needs to make restitution to the Lord. So too, any gift among the sacred donations that the Israelite offers shall be the priest. 
and each shall retain his sacred donations. Each priest shall keep what is given to him. This is that Levitical system, and God established this Levitical system that the priest who is set apart to serve the Lord and the people. Remember, it's not just service to the Lord. Service to the Lord is service to the people. Well, why does he get this? Why doesn't he have to do this? Because he's serving the Lord, and for service to the Lord, he is serving the people. And when you take a look at the movement of the tabernacle on the pack in the tabernacle, it's not such light duty. Not just such easy things, because for 40 years they moved a lot of times. Over that period of time, they moved a lot of times. And you've got to remember, this is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job. There's a 24-hour, six-day-a-week, 24 by six. But still, the duties of the Shabbat are still the requirement of the priest. So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, If any man's wife has gone astray and broken faith with him, and that a man has had carnal relations with her unbeknown to her husband, and she keeps secret the fact that she has defiled herself without being forced, and there is no witness against her, but a fit of jealousy comes over him, and he is wrought up about the wife who has defiled herself. Or if a fit of jealousy comes over one, and he is wrought up about his wife, although she has not defiled herself, the man shall bring his wife to the priest, and he shall bring an offering for her of one-tenth of an ephah of barley flour. No oil shall be poured upon it, and no frankincense shall be laid on it. For it is a meal offering of jealousy, a meal offering of remembrance, which recalls wrongdoing. Hmm. Interesting scenario. I think my wife has had an affair. I'm now going to take her publicly, and I'm going to accuse her of it publicly. I'm going to pay a price, a small price, just a handful of flour, a price that anybody, poor person, can afford. Everybody can afford a little handful of flour. But I'm going to take her and I'm going to publicly accuse her. You really want to do that? So if she did it, you proved your point. Now what? If she didn't do it, you proved your point. Now what? Who wins? Who could possibly win? Give me an example, a biblical example of this having happened. The only time you read about it is right here. Why? Deterrent. Oh, you can do this. You can make this a public spectacle. And you can accuse her, but if you're found out to be wrong, then what? What damage have you done? Is this about the accusation in a public forum, or is this about jealousy? Or is this about a deterrent, both for the adulterer and the adulteress, and the accusation, and the public proclamation of it? Because who wins in a scenario like this? Who benefits? Is the sanctity of marriage such that men and women should not commit adultery? Does it happen? It happens. Does it happen in the body of believers? It does, and that truly is an offense to me. That's the worst offense to me. Statistically, the fact that 50% of all marriages end in divorce is horrendous. But what's more horrendous is 50% of all believers' marriages end in divorce. That's appalling. What happened that being set apart became so easily compromised? Was it because they weren't really believers? Was it because it was artificial? Was it because it was just a profession of faith, but there was no transformation in their life? Was there no repentant heart? Was there no true Matthew 5, 17 experience of being truly born again and becoming a new creation? Or was it just now a fancy way of meeting women? Or a fancy way of meeting men? Was it just a convenient meeting place because where else on Saturday morning can you get a couple hundred people together? Have coffee all under innocent and make eyes at each other. Can an alcoholic minister in a bar? Or is he constantly faced with that temptation where he will stumble? Is it possible? Sure it's possible. If he's surrounded by non-alcoholic ministers with him that are going to keep him from stumbling. 
What have we created in this world of where it's so easy to become a believer? Oh, you mean all you have to do is make a profession of faith and that's it, and now you've got eternal promises? No, the set-apart life is more than just the artificial, superficial declaration. That's the first step. But it's a condition of the heart. And God's trying to show us it's a condition of the heart. Do you really want to put your wife or your husband on public display in front of the priest, in this case me, standing outside when everybody's gathered together and say, hey, hold on a second, let's put the service on hold because we have an accusation. And now here's what we have to do. The priest shall bring her forward and have her stand before the Lord. Then he'll take sacred water in an earthen vessel and taking some of the earth that's on the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall put it into the water. After he's made the woman stand before the Lord, the priest shall bear the woman's head and place upon her hands the meal offering of remembrance, which is a meal offering of jealousy. And in the priest's hand shall be the water of bitterness that induces the spell. The priest shall adjure the woman, saying to her, If no man is lain with you, if you have not gone astray in defilement while married to your husband, be immune to harm from this water of bitterness that induces the spell. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and have defiled yourself, if a man other than your husband has had carnal relations with you, here the priest shall administer the curse of adjuration to the woman. As the priest goes on to say to the woman, May the Lord make you a curse and an imprecation among your people. As the Lord causes your thigh to sag and your belly to distend, may this water that induces the spell enter your body, causing the belly to distend and the thigh to sag. And the woman shall say, Amen, amen, meaning let it be so. Talking about miscarriage. Stillbirth and miscarriage. That if she's pregnant, that the baby will come to an end if she's committed adultery. It's quite a curse, especially in this environment where childbirth is such a sacred event. This is a curse. The priest shall put these curses down in writing and rub it off into the water of bitterness. He's to make the woman drink the water of bitterness that induces the spell so that the spell-inducing water may enter, enter her to bring on bitterness. Then the priest shall take from the woman's hand the meal offering of jealousy, elevate the meal offering before the Lord, and present it on the altar. The priest shall scoop out of the meal offering a token part of it and turn it into smoke on the altar. Last, he shall make the woman drink the water. Once he's made her drink the water, if she has defiled herself by breaking faith with her husband, the spell-inducing water shall enter her to bring on bitterness, so that her belly shall distend and her thigh shall sag, and the woman shall become a curse among her people. But if the woman is not defiled herself and is pure, she shall be unharmed and able to retain seed. This is the ritual in cases of jealousy when a woman goes astray while married to her husband and defiles herself, or when a fit of jealousy comes over a man and he is wrought up over his wife. The woman shall be made to stand before the Lord, and the priest shall carry out all this ritual with her. The man shall be clear of guilt, but that woman shall suffer for her guilt. Whoa. That's a big deal, isn't it? How many instances of this in the Bible do we read about? None. Can you imagine if that were the case today? In a fit of jealousy, you had to bring someone forward, and this is what we did. A deterrent, clearly established as a massive deterrent. Why is the Word of God supposed to be preached? with words included in it like sin, consequence, heaven, hell. Deterrence to sin. Is it to control people? Or is it to let them know that the Word of God is filled with expectation and standards that God wants us to meet in order to receive His blessings? How many of you have a pitcher at home that has a crack in it that leaks all over the place and you continue to use it for water every single day? You don't, do you? That would be foolishness. Well, if you're a vessel for the Lord and you have this sin crack in you, and every time the Lord pours into you, you leak it out and defile it, why would He continue to do so? He wouldn't. Therefore, this is the temple of the Lord. This body is the temple of the Lord. If I continue to defile it, what am I doing? I'm defiling the temple of the Lord. Well, in one respect, we say, oh, I would never do that. In the other respect, we do it. So where's the disconnect? 
heart and head. I know I shouldn't do it, but my heart led me to do it. God wants those two to line up. It's a big journey, isn't it? It's a huge distance. The longest distance that anything has to travel is from the heart to the brain in return. Being set apart is not easy on your own. But it's incredibly easy with the power and the, and the presence of the Lord. Incredibly easy. Chapter 6. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If any one man or woman explicitly utters a Nazarite's vow to set himself apart for the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and any other intoxicant. He shall not drink vinegar or wine or any other intoxicant. Neither shall he drink anything in which grapes have been steeped, nor eat grapes fresh or dried. Throughout his term as Nazarite, he may not eat anything that is obtained from the grapevine, even seeds or skin. Now, Yeshua was from Nazareth, did not make him a Nazarite, didn't have him take a Nazarite vow. We see instances. Samson was under a Nazarite vow. Who else was under a Nazarite vow? John the Baptist, yoking on the immerser. We see this as someone set apart that would have nothing to do with the fruit of the vine. Fermented. Set apart. A standard by which don't shave the temples of the head. So what do you see today in the Hasid community? They don't shave this part. Right? Okay. They have the peot, peus. Okay. So this hair is never, this area of the head is never shaved. Part of this set apart. Are they easily recognized? They are. Easy to recognize who's Hasidic and who's not. So would you offer them a, uh, hey, Rebbe, come on, I'll take and get your hair cut. Come on, it's on me. Okay, not your standard offer, is it? Hey, let's go get a drink over by the barbershop. Okay, not your standard conversation, is it? No. Okay, clearly set apart. How many of you know anybody who is Hasidic? Any of you know anybody who is Hasidic? Okay. Would you talk to them differently? I know I do. And my mother had a travel agency in Pittsburgh and, and uh, supported the Hasidic community quite a bit, uh, the Lubavitchers and the Hasidic community. And so they would come into the store and everybody spoke to them differently, completely differently than they spoke to everybody else. It was always more solemn. It was always more reverent. just because of the way they looked. How many of you, when you see the white collar, speak to the person wearing the white collar differently than you do to someone else, just because of their appearance? Well, by the same token, how many of you walk by a homeless person and look at them differently just because of their appearance? Is this really what we're about? Is this appearance? Are we so visual that we treat people differently? Didn't Yeshua say that, uh, or was it Yeshua or Paul in the New Covenant, um, welcome strangers because you might be entertaining an angel? Yeshua, Yeshua said that. It's all in the New Covenant. You know, it's, it's, the attributes sometimes get, get confusing as to who said what. But it's there. It's on that side of the book. <laughs> and so we have to understand that these vows, now it's interesting to understand the concept of vows. Didn't Yeshua say, don't make your vows? Don't swear by heaven, for it's God's, it's, uh, don't swear by earth because it's God's footstool, or by heaven. And isn't it interesting that Kol Nidre, which is the evening service for the Day of Atonement, is called kol nidre, which means all vows, V-O-W-S. And on that night, we gather together and we disavow all vows that we made that we couldn't keep. How difficult do you think it would be in a society where the fruit of the vine, where how you looked and how you behaved, and now you are even more set apart 
how difficult a standard that might be in a society. Think about it today, how you try to be set aside, set apart, being in the world but not of the world. Can you really not ever be exposed to R-rated? Can you ever really be exposed, to be so insulated from, from billboards or magazine covers or standing in line at the grocery store? It's virtually impossible in today's environment so saturated by the media. And if you read the news at all, you're exposed to just as much filth. The words used in, in uh, uh, the newspaper today would have been, you would have gotten your mouth washed out with soap. These were words that weren't even uttered. But imagine a Nazarite vow. Imagine allowing no wine, which was ceremonial. It was, uh, you know, how many of you grew up in a home where a drink, that was fellowship. Come on, let's go out for a drink. Let's go to a happy hour. Let's go do this. It was, you know, where, oh, you know, so-and-so's coming over for drinks before we go to dinner. Right? And that kind of the environment that many grew up in where that was pretty standard. So imagine somebody in that environment going, no, no thanks, I've, I've taken a vow. Whoa. What would they call you? Reverend or, oh, you know, now you're holier than thou. Oh, you know, everybody's doing it, but you're too good to do that. Right? Some of you get persecuted for coming here. Oh, what are you, Jewish now? <laughs> oh, you laugh, but some of you have received persecution from people you know. Oh, are you a Jew now? Like there's something wrong with that. You mean like your Messiah? <laughs> but imagine what it was like for a Nazarite vow. Throughout the term of his vow as Nazarite, no razor shall touch his head. It shall mean remain consecrated until the completion of his term as Nazarite of the Lord, the hair of his head being left to grow untrimmed. Throughout the term that he is set apart for the Lord, he shall not go in where there is a dead person. Now, I know people that funerals would not go into the family funeral, would not attend a funeral, would not go into the funeral, because they felt that that was being defiled. And so it's important that we understand that there are people that have strong beliefs. Now, when we take a look at the Essenes, which were a group set apart, a very spiritual people, and it was believed that John the Baptist, Yochanan, was with them for several years. There's evidence to support that's what he was doing out in the desert, that's reason to support that he knew the Scriptures the way he did, that this was a sect of Judaism, the Essenes, that were very, very set apart, that his style and behavior and conduct were very much in keeping with the Essenes. And so there's many things that give us understanding about these vows and being set apart because we understand that uh, if you remember as we come upon the Scriptures in regards to the Passover, they went into the city and they found a man carrying water. You remember that? Probably fell on deaf ears for most. Men don't carry water unless you're in a scene. It was only the Essenes who were the men that carried water in Jerusalem at that time. And therefore, the house that they must have been going to must have been in a scene. And so now that you understand contextually what's going on, and you see the relevance of these kind of things that are so subtle in the Scripture, we begin to understand back in here in Torah this whole concept is set apart because why is it relevant? It's relevant because then we understand the people. When the Messiah was there, if you don't understand what the tradition was and what the reasoning was and what the belief system was back here, and we try to contextualize and contemporize the Gospels without an understanding of who they were and what was going on and the subtlety of all this, and even in the parables of a virgin attending to a bridegroom, you really think that in Yeshua's time in Judaism that a single man would be left alone with ten virgins? 
he would never have been left alone with a woman, period. The same way that I have blinds and doors and windows in my office because it is so much the appearance of wrongdoing for me to come out of a dark office with a woman. That's why I always say if you're coming into my office and the blinds are shut, open the blinds, turn on the light, open the door. After services are going there, if you're going to follow me in there, you're going to have to wait until everything gets turned on and is appropriate. It needs to be seen from the parking lot and from the, from the walkway so that nothing. So this is a standard. Shun all appearance of wrongdoing. Well, these are standards. So it makes you scratch your head a little bit and say, well, I wonder what that was about. That's good. You should scratch your head. Look into it. So if a person suddenly dies, dies suddenly near him, defiling his consecrated hair, he shall shave his head on the day he becomes clean. He shall shave it on the seventh day. On the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two pigeons to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The priest shall offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering and make expiation on behalf for the guilt that he incurred through the corpse. That same day he shall consecrate his head and rededicate to the Lord his term as Nazarite, and he shall bring a lamb in its first year as a penalty offering. The previous period shall be void since his consecrated hair was defiled. This is the ritual of the Nazarite. On the day that his term as Nazarite is completed, he shall be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. As his offering to the Lord, he shall present one male lamb in its first year without blemish for a burnt offering, one ewe lamb in its first year without blemish for a sin offering, one ram without blemish for an offering of well-being, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of choice, flour with oil mixed in, and unleavened wafers spread with oil, and the proper meal offerings and libations. So we see that within this covenant, within this Nazarite vow, that there is a deterrent. The deterrent means that not only are you with a population of people separated and to be set apart, you're now moved into the desert, but within that same group, you are now further set apart. We have a question? Yes. Yes. Was this a lifetime vow? Um, my no. Bible says for a period. No, it was a period. Sir, a period it, of time? it was for a period of time. Okay, it wasn't a lot. All right. You know, each person had a uh, um, uh, you were compelled to do this. John, the AC is back on. It's chilly, please. Um, you made this vow for a period of time. It was kind of a term commitment. Each person's term was different, and each person did it for a different reason. But if you took the vow, you know, first of all, it wasn't for everybody. It's kind of like um, we understand the vow of celibacy. Okay, that's a requirement of the Roman Catholic Church, a vow of celibacy. Is there any other denomination that requires a vow of celibacy? To my knowledge, there is not. So it's not for everybody. You want to be a member of the priesthood. You want to be a member of the clergy. You want to minister the Word of God, but you want to be married. Okay, well, then the Roman Catholic priesthood is not for everybody. The same way a Nazarite vow wasn't for everybody. There are deterrents. There are conditions associated with it. And if you're willing to meet these conditions and suffer the consequences that go along with it if you break the vow. Well, what's the bigger picture here? If he is accidentally defied, somebody dies right next to him, and I'm talking to you, you die, you fall into me, and you're dead. Guess what? My vow is broken. That seems pretty strict, doesn't it? Well, what's the incidence? You know, I've been around you all for four years and nobody's died and fallen on me. I don't think that anybody's ever died in my presence before. So it's not a common occurrence. But yet there's a condition associated with it, and when you're in these close quarters and these close confines and there's two million people around you, maybe the incidence is much greater. But what if you're in a battle zone? What if you're making a Nazarite vow and you're in war and somebody's shot with an arrow and falls into you? It's quite a deal. It's quite a big deal to be set apart to the Lord. It's quite a big deal that you who have been called to be set apart to the Lord, it's a big deal. There's a lot of conditions on you. Most people believe in their heart of hearts that being a believer is a spectator sport. But the ones who really 
way into this call. I understand it's full contact. It's full contact all the time with the Holy One of Israel. It's full contact with the Messiah. It's full contact in God's kingdom. And there is no compromising. And in this compromising that we do, well, we make a little adjustment there, we make a little adjustment there, we flirt with this, we flirt with that. God doesn't want that. It's clear in Scripture, if you're not for Him completely, then you're against Him. There's no neutral zone. So there's a deterrent to making a vow. Is this like all vows? Yeah, it's a deterrent to making vows to the Lord. I promise I'm going to do this. Lord, if you do this, I promise I'll do this. Well, he does it, and what if you break your vow to him? Isn't it interesting that in Jewish tradition, we have this service once a year, and we celebrate this service. We call it Kol Nidre. We break all vows. We ask God to absolve us of all vows we made in the prior year to him that we did not keep. Why? Because on that day when I stand before the Lord and judgment is met out, And the record of my life is brought before me. And he says, well, you know, I know you try to do this, this, and this, but what about this promise you made me and you didn't fulfill it? Well, what about this that you said you were going to do? Well, I don't want that standing before him. If my time comes on the Day of Atonement, or if it comes during the course of the year, now as a believer in Messiah, I believe I'm washed clean. I do believe that I am washed clean. I believe that all my sins are forgiven. But I want an opportunity just to be sure. Measure twice, cut once. Sometimes, John, measure three times. Or four. (laughs) Or four. And so in understanding God establishing very strict covenant standards, what difference is your vow in accepting salvation What difference is your vow of becoming a disciple of Messiah? What difference is your vow as you read in Matthew 5, 17 through Matthew 6, 10? Because that's really the block of Scripture that applies. Anyone who's a Messiah is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You've been called into a ministry of reconciliation that God is reconciling man, God, and man. And he's called you as his personal ambassador to bring the message of reconciliation. So no matter whether or not you're in good times or bad times, whether or not you're hungry or thirsty, whether or not you're tired, whether or not you're rich, you're poor, you're rich in the Lord and therefore you're to rejoice and you conduct yourself as a believer in all circumstances. Whether or not you're healthy or sick, you're healthy. Whether or not you're hungry or thirsty, you're well fed and, and uh, hydrated. Whether or not you're rich or poor, you're rich. Whether or not you're under attack or you're not under attack, you're victorious. That's those scriptures. And when you said that you asked Yeshua into your heart and you were going to dedicate your life to Him and that you were going to serve Him, this is your vow to Him. Now, it's interesting that when we break that vow, we don't have to bring a goat and a sheep and a ram and a pile of money to Him every time we broke it because we'd all be in bankruptcy court. That's why the blood of Messiah is so significant, so important, because we've made this vow and we accept it. But this is a commitment to the Lord. This is saying, I'm going to dedicate myself to you. And if you did it with an agenda, because God is the great vending machine, and I'm going to put in my prayer request, and I'm going to put in this offering, and I'm going to get out all these things that he's going to give me, well, then you've been sold a TBN kind of salvation. Okay, sow your seed in here, and this is what you're going to get in return. And so it's important for us to understand very clearly that God will bring the rain, won't he? Praise the Lord. Wash some of that uh, green stuff. I've never seen so many green cars in my life. So Nazarites who completed their period of dedication came with their sacrifice to the priest, and it was important that they fulfilled what they were responsible for. This is like a graduation ceremony. This is a, you made it, you did it, you fulfilled your vow before the Lord. It is spectacular, it is wonderful. How many of you have ever made a vow to God and fulfilled it? A commitment to do something. 
I'm going to give uh, above and beyond. I'm going to make this commitment like to the building fund. That's a vow. That's a commitment. Above and beyond your tithe, and you fulfilled it. You should rejoice. You should celebrate that. You should celebrate that. It's a great day of celebration when you make a promise to God and you fulfill it because most people don't. The condition of man's heart is such that, you know, I've told you that story before, that this man had been unemployed for eight or nine months. And no matter what job he went on, what interview he went on, he just got passed over. He wasn't the one selected, he wasn't the one selected, he wasn't the one selected. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And finally it came time that this company that he had longed for, longed to get the job for, called him and gave him a two o'clock interview. And they said, no matter what, don't be late. So he left his house and he got to the building where the interview was and he drove around the parking lot and there were no spaces. And it's now seven minutes to two, and he's starting to get a little nervous. He's got to park the car, he's got to get in the building, he's got to get up front, he's got to get announced by the receptionist, it can't be late, and he's starting to panic. He's driving around, he's driving around, no cars are leaving. It's an office building, hours are, you know, nine to five, and so there's not people coming and going. All the employees are parked there, all the spaces are full, and he's driving around, he's now in the furthest parking lot, and he's driving around, and there are no spaces, and now it's four minutes to two. And this is his last chance. He's desperate. And finally, he pulls around the, the parking lot one more time, and he goes, Lord, if you just give me a parking space, I promise that I will never miss another service again. And he opens his eyes, and lo and behold, there's a parking space in front of him. And he goes, never mind, Lord, I found one. <laughs> and isn't this the nature of man? Okay, we make these promises and then we call it off. Oh, Lord, if you'll just do this for me, I'll be faithful. But when you get what you've asked for, you forget because you're now rejoicing you got what you wanted. You forgot the promise you made to the Lord. So what's the message there? There's a great deal of requirement about making a vow. And when we look at this condition about a Nazarite, oh, he took a Nazarite vow, he just didn't cut his hair, and just didn't drink wine. No, he was truly set apart. Among a people that drank wine, among a people that cut their hair and had different standards of what holiness was, he was now going to be different. And he couldn't be defiled by a dead body. And if he was defiled by a dead body and he was involved in something that was unclean, he had to redeem, he had to pay, he had a consequence. And so it was quite significant in God establishing what a vow is and looking at the standards of making vows before the Lord. Well, what vows do most of us take? Let me hear it. Wedding vows. Oh, a vow. Isn't it called a wedding vow? Isn't a covenant commitment established? A lot of consequences for breaking it. God wants us to understand that we must not take our word lightly. You know, just because in America we have laws, and in some other countries they have laws around marriage and divorce, the truth of the matter is, the laws surrounding marriage and divorce come from God. The laws of defilement come from God. The laws and standards of clean and unclean come from God, not from man. Just because there's a loophole in the civil law, just because there's a loophole in this, and just because there's a judge that sits on a, on a bench and says, okay, well, you get this property, you get this property, and you get the kids, and you pay this, and you do that, doesn't mean that God is involved in that scenario. And when you make a vow, God wants you to take it seriously. And when you redeem that vow, He wants there to be a consequence to you. And when you break that vow, he wants there to be a consequence because he doesn't want you to take this gift lightly. Well, here we are in a Messianic Jewish believing congregation where when you said yes to the Messiah, it was not casual. It wasn't to be taken for granted. It wasn't your e-ticket out of here. It was to be taken as a covenant commitment to walk with, to be set apart, to live a life that was a reflection of the Messiah. 
Now, don't you think for one minute, if we all led that life that we know we were supposed to lead, that more and more people wouldn't want that life? You bet they would. So why is it that there's such hot and cold out there? Why is it that, that we're not provoking Israel to the envy that we know we should because we have this incredible gift? We have something that other people don't have, but yet we act just like everybody else. So if that gift is so precious and so wonderful, shouldn't you act differently? Shouldn't you act like you have something that somebody else doesn't have that they would want? Well, we take it so casually. And these lessons are given to us so that we would value and we would cherish. And we would be extraordinary in our behavior and our treatment of other people. And that we would earnestly seek a righteous life. Is it obtainable? No. All our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. God wants our intent He wants us on the path to righteousness. He knows we're not going to accomplish it. But if it's our goal, and it's not a futile goal, because every step I take towards that is another step closer. It's more distance from the world, which is ugly, which people killing people, lying people, maligning people, injuring people, saying horrible things about people, nobody helping each other. The story of the Good Samaritan. The priest walked by him and left him there. Oh, because he had his standards. I can't, I can't deal with some. Who was it? It was the Samaritan that stopped to help the Jewish man. What have we gotten in our heads about this standard and the way we're supposed to do things? And I'm so enamored with the way. This is the way we're supposed to do things. And if you have the Lord, you don't have an excuse anymore for not knowing. If the Bible is available to you, this is basic instruction before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Right? And God's showing us that to be set apart has requirements, has standards, has performance clauses. So now we understand that it's not for everybody. The path to destruction is wide. The road to salvation is narrow. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now we begin to understand these words. that It's not for everybody. You mean there's a standard? I'm going to be held accountable? There's performance involved? There's accountability involved? Yeah, there's accountability on earth, and there's accountability in heaven. And there's mutual accountability. You hold me accountable for preaching the Word of God, for my conduct and behavior, and for the administration of the congregation, and for finances, and I hold you accountable for what you say and what you do in the congregation and outside the congregation. And it should be that way in a community. And there should be a community where people aren't getting offended, and people aren't getting upset. And I'm not sitting there in judgment and trying to decide between this member of the congregation and this member of the congregation because of a dispute. I praise the Lord, and in four years' time, we've had one dispute. One dispute. One. With this many people, one. Because you get it. And if you can't get along with each other, don't do business with each other. Don't let it affect your relationship with each other and the Lord. If you've got to be a hard guy in a contract, pick somebody else out. But have somebody you trust be your foreman, be your superintendent. Right, John? And then put the hammer down. So it's important. This is the ritual for the Nazarite. On the day that his term as Nazarite is completed, he shall be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. As his offering, he shall bring a lamb in its first year without blemish for a burnt offering. The priest shall present them before the Lord and offer the sin offering and the burnt offering. He shall offer the ram as a sacrifice of well-being to the Lord, together with a basket of unleavened cakes. The priest shall also offer the meal offerings and the libations. The Nazarite shall then shave his consecrated hair at the entrance of the tent of meeting and take the locks of his consecrated hair and put them on the fire that is under the sacrifice of well-being. 
The priest shall then take the shoulder of the ram when it has been boiled, one unleavened cake from the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and place them on the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his consecrated hair. The priest shall elevate them as an elevation offering before the Lord, and this shall be a sacred donation for the priest, in addition to the breast of the elevation offering and the thigh of the gift offering. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. Such is the obligation of a Nazarite, except that he who vows an offering to the Lord of what he can afford, beyond his Nazarite requirements, must do exactly according to the vow that he has made beyond his obligation as a Nazarite. So if I say that not only now, but then forever, not only now, but I'm going to do this later, once your time and your term and this vow that you made as a Nazarite is completed, you still have to fulfill whatever other, uh, other obligations you have made. Why? Because your commitment to the Lord doesn't end just because one part of it ends. Your promise to the Lord is as eternal to Him as your salvation is to you. We need to understand that. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to Aaron and his sons, thus shall you bless the people of Israel, say to them, the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord deal kindly and graciously with you. The Lord bestow his favor upon you and grant you peace. Thus they shall link my name with the people of Israel and I will bless them. The ironic benediction that we do, number 622. We talked last night in the sermon in the series we're doing about gifts that the giftings of the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts is for the benefit and the benefit of the congregation of the body. All completely founded in the Torah for the betterment and the establishment of the community of Israel and the children of Israel, those natural born and those grafted in who become B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. And so God is setting up these standards. And when you read in Scripture and you read, this applies to you, the children of Israel, and the alien living among you. And you begin to see this bigger picture of this community, the commonwealth of Israel. You begin to see that these things do apply to the new covenant believer. These aren't thrown away. These are actually the establishment, the foundation of new covenant life. And in this new covenant it's no longer under compulsion that you have to do these things. It's now understanding what's pleasing to God and what's not pleasing to God. And to do whatever you're able to do, not under conviction and compulsion, but because of what God prompts you to do in drawing closer to Him. You know, legalism, the law without love is legalism. This forcing somebody to do anything. Did anyone force anyone in the Bible to take a Nazarite vow? They didn't. Dedicated as a Nazarite from birth, then made aware of the vow that's been made for you, and then choosing to live that life are all part of that. As parents and as a congregation, we dedicate children to the Lord here. And as parents, we do that. And while they're under our covering, we are responsible and accountable to them spiritually. But once they're of age, they now need to make those decisions for themselves. That's why I can say to my child at birth, they're under the covering of the Lord, but when they reach of age, they have to answer that same call themselves, that, that age of consent. What is it? For some of you, it's five years old. For some of you, it's 85 years old. It doesn't really matter what age you are. It's the day in which you're ready to receive, to understand what decision you're making. But many of us have made that decision many years ago and forgotten the heaviness, the weightiness of this decision that we made. Oh, we rejoice that we're turned around, that our life is made new, but now what are we doing about it? What path are we on? Have we strayed from that path? Have we drifted from that path? Because the natural tendency is to drift, to drift. Oh, it's not under power, so I'm not headed in the wrong direction, but I could have drifted off of course to get into the wrong direction. I may be further away from where I want to be. So we have to correct our course. We have to correct our course. We read this in Numbers to understand that separation in God's economy is very specific. He separates the clean from the unclean. He separates us by our vow that we make. And don't think that your acceptance of Messiah is not a vow to the Lord. It is. It says, in all terms, I'm now forgiven 
I'm no longer going to practice sin. I understand that if I commit sin, I need to go to the Lord for forgiveness or to the person who I've offended. I'm now going to be accountable for my sin. Oh, it's easier to go through life without that accountability, except that the consequences in death are so great. Why does a parent want their child to come to know the Messiah? Because if they're a believer, they don't want to be separated. You didn't bring the child in the world to be separated from them for eternity. And why does a child want their parent to come into the kingdom? Because they know where they're going and they want to be with them for eternity. I love you, mom. I love you, dad. I love you, child. I don't want to be separated from you. So since I know the truth and I'm sharing with you the truth, I want to be with you forever. I love you that much that I want it for eternity. I don't want it just for this short life that I have on earth. What what are we promised? You know, what's the new life expectancy? 78.2 years. Okay, if you've lived further, you know, you're on borrowed time. I don't like to think of it like that, but it's above the norm. For an average to be, there has to be a high and there has to be a low. But we love you. We want to be with you for eternity, not temporary. Now, we live in a very temporary world. We live in a very immediate world. You're not on borrowed time, buddy. Okay? God's not through with you. I don't know when he's going to be through with you. You know what I'm saying? He's got, got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we love you. And so we have to understand that this is a commitment. If we do things the same way we did things when we came to the Lord, then are we really born again? Are we really a new creation? Are we just an old creation now wearing new clothes? And so in this understanding of the Nazarite vow, and understanding what it's like to be truly set apart, are we to look at ourselves as a new covenant believer in the Messiah and look at that and try to identify, not with the Nazarite vow in itself, but the concept of a set apart commitment to really understanding what it means that in a society where everything is okay, we live in a world today where everything is okay, that if it's not illegal, do it, and if it's illegal, do it so you don't get caught. That is the standard of this world we live in. We are not respecters of authority, we're not respecters of law, and therefore we move the boundaries of law because of popular opinion. Our congressmen and our legislators are moved by popular opinion and by a desire to be reelected. So we will authorize abortion, we'll authorize gay and lesbian rights, we'll authorize all these other conditions in order to justify our behavior so it's no longer illegal. That's all the man's desire is, is to make it no longer illegal so I can do it. Why the big push to legalize marijuana? So that I can do legally what I've been doing in secret. So in this understanding of the Nazarite vow, this is someone who is publicly proclaimed. My goodness, don't many of you publicly proclaim you wear a star of David or a crucifix or you wear something outwardly or you have a license plate or a fish on your, on your car? Doesn't that say you took a vow? Doesn't that say to the world, look at me, I'm set apart? But when you go slamming, and I shared this with my group this morning, I read a posting by one of the people that comes to services here who was going to a Bible study on Wednesday night at a local church. And here was the posting that they wrote. To the driver of the gray Yukon. It was uncalled for with your hand gestures. It was uncalled for for you to roll down your window and shout at me. And it was uncalled for for you to cut me off and take the parking space in front of me in the parking lot of the church before Bible study. You want to wear an outward appearance on your automobile or on your shirt, oh, I love Yeshua. What difference is that than your Nazarite vow of your long hair and your abstinence from drink? If you're going to set yourself apart, be set apart. Understand that you bought into something just as specific as a Nazarite vow when you said yes to Yeshua. Amen? All right, we're going to close it and get ready for Hebrew class.